My name is Michael Lippmann, uh, one of the co-founders of Blue Raster. I'm here with John Nordling. He's a solutions architect on the Blue Raster team as well. The topic for today's uh, discussion is emerging hotspots of global tree cover loss. Now, what does that actually mean? I'm just going to pull this out to make it easier. So the project itself is a big data analysis powered primarily by Amazon Web Services. And we're going to explain how we came up with the research idea and then how we executed it and how that's making a difference for, for forests globally. So if we think about forests in the world today, they're really the lungs of the earth. Without trees, we don't have air. Without air, nothing can live. So our primary goal for this, for this effort was to try to better understand forests, how humans are impacting forests, as well as the ecosystems. So one of the primary dilemmas we're, we're leading up to the, the big climate meetings in Paris uh, later, later this month into December, a big dilemma is that m a tremendous amount of the forest cover has been lost over, the, over recent years. Over 30% has been cleared for palm oil plantations alone. And today, only 15% of the historic tree cover remains intact. So if you're not familiar with palm oil, We'll, we'll get into that in a second. But if you look at, at Indonesia specifically, which is where a great deal of the palm oil comes from, over 50% of the forest cover has been cut down from 1985 to 2008 alone. And about 90% of those oil palm plantations were at the expense of forest cover. So forests that have been there for, for pretty much forever are being cut down simply for this commodity crop. This is an image uh, taken uh, in Indonesia of, of what one of these plantations looks like. And in the background, you might think that that's actually a forest, but for the entire area, that's actually a number of plantations that have been put in, into place all by cutting down the forests. And this is all able to be viewed by satellite imagery, aerial imagery, and a number of different sources. So to help you understand a little bit more, if you you may not cook with it, but you most certainly use it. And I was, I was thinking back just this past weekend. I ate some pizza, my daughter had some ice cream, and she had some cookies. So we've consumed palm oil. If you did laundry, you probably had some palm oil in, in that as well. So it's a product that, that humans in general are just using, and it's at the expense of, of forests. So all day today, we've been talking about Earth observation, satellite sensors. We've heard from Digital Globe, Planet Labs. We've talked about Landsat, MODIS. All of these sensors are providing information that we can, we can leverage to try to help under, better understand forests and be able to, to not only understand, but take action on it. So if we take a look at Landsat from 1974 to, to 2010, you can see some dramatic change here. Does anyone know where in the world this is? There you go, Las Vegas. So just looking at, at the, the Landsat coverage, we can really get a quick understanding of, of how humans can impact the land. That's not a topic that we really need to cover too much today, but this is gonna lead into showing how we've impacted forest cover. So taking a look, this is, the, this is known as the Hansen data set in, in the scientific community. What you're looking at specifically is tree cover loss from 2001 until 2014. So all of the areas that are lighting up, that's where there has been tree cover loss. So just in this century alone, you can see how many trees have been cut down. And where we're particularly focused is in the tropics. So Southeast Asia, Africa, DRC, and, and South America. And those areas are being cut down for many of the commodity crops that we're consuming today. That coverage is coming from 30 meter resolution. So now let's get into the analysis. What, what did we actually try to accomplish at Blue Raster? So one of our research goals was to generate what's called an emerging hotspot. Now to explain very briefly what an emerging hotspot is, this is a tool that's available in the ArcGIS platform and it enables you to look at data in a, in a new and pretty exciting way. So instead of just looking at, at data um, that's, that's flat, you're able to bring in both space and time together. So, so in these cubes that we have up here, this is actually a space-time cube. So in the, in the extrusions uh, on the screen on the left there, you're, you're able to actually see 
each, each location where there's an, an Earth observation, and then the, the lines that are in that extrusion give you a data value from, from the start to the finish. So where you're seeing a lot of red, that's an indicator that, that that's a hot spot, both, both in a location but also over time. So here's another example. The, the space-time cubes are sometimes used in very localized areas. One of the very common examples is looking at crime data in a city and trying to understand where is crime occurring. Well, we decided let's take that and apply it to a global data set. So we took the Hansen data set, the global map of forest loss data, and we needed to break it down in it, into its component parts so that we could actually process it using AWS. So if you, if you look at that data set, it's actually made out of a series of, of granules. Oftentimes today we call, we, we use the word tile, so I'll, I'll use those interchangeably. So, so on the surface of the earth, we've got 14 from north to south and 36 from, from west to east. So if you do the math on that, that takes you to 504 granules that need to get processed. Those are basically 10 degree by 10 degree granules. So inside each one of those tiles, they're 40,000 pixels by 40,000 pixels uh, in size. So you have a total of 1.6 billion Earth observations in each one of those tiles that you, need to, that you need to analyze. And so for each one of those, we have data that goes all the way back to 2001, and then each year we can see whether or not forest loss has occurred up to 2014. So to help bring context, if you're, if you're not familiar with what, with what a 10 degree by 10 degree tile is, if you take one of the pixels, so out of the 1.6 billion pixels, one single pixel would be about the size of a baseball infield. So very, very small uh, scale analysis that we're looking at to try to understand the, the, the forest loss. So if you do the math on that, 504 tiles times 1.6 billion pixels, we have 806 billion Earth observations that we need to, to iterate through. And we're not just looking at that one time, we're looking that, at that for each year, and then and then as we're doing that, we need to iterate as we're tweaking the algorithm a little bit. So now I'm gonna actually pass the mic over to John Norling, and he's gonna talk a bit about the computing challenge and how we did this, and then what the next steps are with the analysis. Thanks very much. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, like Mike said, we're gonna kind of shift a little bit and talk about more about how we actually did that, looking at it from a challenge perspective, a processing perspective, and s some of the tools that we use in order to process this. I mean, in general, we've, we've talked a lot about sort of processing in the cloud, and, and I thought I was really inspired earlier by what Digital Globe was saying, is sort of bringing the program to the, to the data as opposed to bringing the data to the program, and that makes a lot of sense, and that's definitely an approach that we we, we followed here. And so, you know, we have trillions of records. Say we want to we want to process this multiple times because we, we just generally never get it right the first time and you're gonna have to process it over and over again until you get you get a result that you're going to um, you know, be okay with and, and actually be scientific. Um, the average PC or server or whatever you have in your rack room generally can't do this type of process. You're gonna need a, a lot more than my you know, four core laptop and a whole bunch of, of memory. So we needed a plan that was gonna allow us to expand and grow. Of course, our tests can be run locally and we can run this as um, at a small scale for a small city or something. But ultimately what we wanted to do is we wanted to run in large regions and, and ultimately globally. And so in science, and we just never get it right the first time. So we needed a way programmatically to be able to say, okay, run this again with these parameters. Um, and that was really important um, to us, and that was, some of, that, that was one of the main reasons we went and moved to sort of a cloud-based computing system. And so I, I put this image together because this was me one day outside of uh, Blue Raster, and I was, I was trying to run this on my computer, and I came back three days later, and it was, my computer was really hot. I thought it was going to blow up. So I don't know if Amazon wants to, to coin this, but I thought it was a really awesome photo put together. Um, <laughs> And so the solution really was to be on Amazon. Um, it's a, one of the most cost-effective things we could do while we were building our infrastructure. And two, it allowed us to, to expand and add different um, components as we found they were needed inside, inside um, the, the process. And so just 
also want to talk about some technologies that we use because we kind of keep talking about just like, okay, build a model and then like put it in the cloud and then run it. But I kind of want to also talk a little bit about some of the tools that you use inside the cloud and that you can leverage in these cloud computing environments that actually allows us to run these models, to parallel distribute, and to, to visualize our results. And one of the first ones we used was a lot of the Esri tools for geoprocessing, definitely the emerging hotspots. When it came time to actually run the emerging hotspots, we could have loaded that on our desktop and ran it, but we decided that we wanted to sort of leverage the multi-threading, multi-processing, all the RAM we could get out of a really nice machine on Amazon. So it actually still ran a, a local desktop environment in the cloud to, to run some of this. Spark, this is by far, I got my first pull request from Spark uh, not that long ago. Um, and this is an open source project produced by Apache, and what it allows you to do, if anyone's in here familiar with sort of map and reduce, this is a new, new sort of technology that allows you to parallel process across multiple machines. So you're going to be able to write a program, and it's going to be able to run across multiple nodes um, really fast. Hadoop, this is how we store our data across multiple machines, because say you take all the data sets and you... Um, they're not all in one location, so imagine you have multiple machines. All those machines have to have access to the data, right, to be able to read and write. So Hadoop's the technology that we use to actually be able to stretch across and, and access this information. Scala. Scala is a fairly new language. It's only been out since 2009, but a lot of people compare it to sort of Java. Um, so if you're a Java developer or, or have Java developers, they'll be comfortable using this. But this is a way to write your, your program to run in a parallel environment. And then we used a ton of Python scripting programming to uh, sort of manipulate and transform data. So wanted to, since this is an AWS conference, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we use inside AWS specifically. And so the first and foremost was EC2. If, if you don't know what EC2 is, EC2 is just a a, 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 a sort of a service that they provide that allows you to spin up servers. Different types of servers deal with volumes of data, and um, that's the service that when you say, I, I got a service, a server in AWS, it's through EC2. Then the next one is the EBS volumes, being able to, to determine the space of each of the, the servers. Um, not much to be said about that, it's just it's partially the, the, the disk space of the server. Elastic IPs. This one, I was like, I wasn't going to put it in there, but then I realized it was really important for cluster computing because the way that you get multiple machines to talk to each other is so that they have a namespace that they know who it is and say, hey, that file's on this machine. And so Elastic IP is the way that these servers can actually talk, communicate to each other. S3 storage was critical here. This is where we stored our results so we could be, um, we could feel secure that our, our, our data was both protected as well as stored in the cloud. So. Um, you know, anyone, anyone on our team could access it at any time and, and step in and do that. CloudWatch, this was my favorite because this stuff isn't cheap, right? To run multiple machines in multiple places that you have to, you have to monitor, you know, you know, this. And we use CloudWatch to basically, when we kicked off a process, to know, hey, that process is done. Sends us an email, sends us an SMS, and we're able to log back onto our account and, um, you know, terminate the machine or power it down. And so we use that as sort of an internal monitoring tool to, to find out the, the status of, of the servers. Uh, now I want to just kind of shift to, to the analysis itself. And, and we talked about sort of the tools that we use to process it and then just take a look at the steps that we, all the code that we had to write. And, and then we'll take a look at a little bit of the road. So we started with the raw data. Mike was explaining the, the sort of at what scale that is. And then, and then, so what we had to do is we had to turn that into points. So ultimately, we had to turn it into points because we needed to run it through the Emerging Hotspot School. It's a long story, but ultimately, we had to take each raster, which is a picture, each, each pixel in that picture has a value. And so we turned that into a comma-separated point file. And that was, that was how we were able to see which value was at which pixel and where. From there, to do the statistical analysis, you need to do an aggregation, and this is where the tweaking came in. And so, you know, first we run it at like 50 kilometers for an aggregation size, and next we decided we wanted to run it at 20 kilometers, and then ultimately we're running at one and a half, half a kilometer. And so this is an aggregation inside a um, sort of a, a different grid that says how many values are in there and what are their values. And then ultimately you get a different, a different um, data set, derived data set. From there, you, you, you want to kind of clip to your region. If you're running globally, obviously you don't do this. 
Um, but you know, when we're testing and isolating, we need to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna look at DRC or we're gonna look at Indonesia specifically, and we want to compare this type of forest versus this type of forest. Um, and so that that was part of the step. The next step is probably the most interesting. It's actually creating a th uh, a three dimensional visualization um, file called a net, uh, NetCDF, which is through its which ultimately the time space cube takes um, in the emerging hotspots, but it's a it's a three dimensional um, grid that shows what's happening and through how much time. And so Mike's already explained it, but if you want, we could spend all day talking about this the the net CDF and and how that gets made. Emerging hotspots. That's where we'll get our results. And so the clusters that we use were M4 10 extra larges with. 40 CPUs, 160 gigs of RAM, and 500 gigabytes of disk space, which isn't that much for one, but when you, when you times that by five, it's 200 cores, 800 gigabytes of RAM, and 2.5 disk space, just to process this data set once. And we ran it lots of times. <laughs> this is generally the workflow. You know, Data goes in, and then it gets the, the, sort of the data and the process goes in, and then the process gets distributed through all the machines, and ultimately the re results come screaming out. This is us just having a really good time, had some support from Esri, us kicking off a Spark process and having a good time. Just a nice photo. I don't know if anybody in the house has seen uh, 40 cores maxed out, but this was my first time when I was doing this. But Mike always tells me, every time I spin up one of these machines, he's always yelling at me, like, if you're not using 99% of the, the server, you're doing it wrong. You know? So I figured I'd throw this in there just to, just, to, just to show that. But ideally, if you're going to spin up one of these machines, you should really be sort of pushing the limits of what you can do. Because it is in the cloud. You don't have to manage that infrastructure. That's what Amazon does. And so if you're not using and leveraging all the cores that you, you've spun up that you're paying for, then you know, you're just doing it wrong. So I want to talk a little bit more about the data set now that we've come through. And this is a really nice representation that one of my colleagues put together. But basically what it's trying to say is none of this actually matters unless you can interpret it. We can process this data. We can run it through some crazy clusters. And, and this is an image that it kind of shows how important symbology is to the data set that you're deriving. And that how you symbolize it really determines what you think of it. So I thought it was nice. Here's a preliminary result. When you first look at this, it's like you feel hot and cold. You're like, oh man, there's lots of stuff going on there, and that feels bad. And there's it's cold there, and that maybe feels better. But that's not really the case, right? When you think about deforestation, you have to look at it within context of, of the topic of what you're doing. And so we really needed to take a step back and say, what is this data set? And What's the best way to visualize this and understand this? Because we know that there's a story to tell here. Um, you know, every pixel is compared to itself, to the things around it, to the other pixels around it through time. So, first glance, this is this is hard to hard to conceptualize, and it took us months. I mean, we spent months trying to figure this out, and um, I think I think ultimately we've 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 got it. So we, we've come up with some different visualizations. Say, OK, let's first let's take a look at this through charts, and let's try to understand this. But this is just a very simple chart representation of what it means in, in the context of deforestation to be a new hotspot versus a consecutive to diminishing and persistent. And again, we, we're not going to get into the science of, of this. But if you, if you are interested in this, um, please, please contact us, because we're working hard on this. Here's, here's a different representation of that same data set that I was just showing you. And this is much more intuitive to understand. And, and um, again, we can, we, can, we can get into this. But ultimately, the, the red here is sort of the new. And then you have areas around it that are changing um, depending on, on there's some consistent things here. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into it, but it's, a, it's nice. So all, So we took the raw data. We ran it through this weird machine and it processed, uh, it created a data set. We created some symbology for it that makes sense and we have a bunch of results. And so now what, we, what we've done is we're looking at next steps and we're trying to figure out what to do with this and we're working really hard with um, WRI. And so I put this together. I don't know if, I don't, not sure if there's any programmers in the house, but basically 
When a process is successful, what does that mean for, for me? That means we have a really happy scientist. And so I just wanted to take a minute um, and just share a video. She, she couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, Nancy Harris from WRI, she's one of the, the, the global forest experts in, in deforestation. And um, just a very brief b b video that, that she put together to explain how this work is, is important to her and, and how it's changing, um, changing some decision making all over the world. And if you can't hear the audio, we'll, we'll skip through it. Awesome, thank you, Nancy. So we have some next steps that are coming up, and we can um, not, I'm not sure exactly when the data, data set's gonna be published and when we're gonna stop running it and tweaking it, but certainly it'll be, it'll be exposed in one of the open data avenues, and, and WRI's definitely following all the open standards and, and when they produce a data set. So I'd, I'd also like to thank Jed and the Amazon team for having us out today and also the Blue Raster team that has put a lot of, lot of time and sweat and effort into um, putting A, this presentation together, and B, uh, all the work behind Emerging Hotspots. So th thank you all. And Mike. And if you have any questions, we're here. Uh, if you understand it correctly, all this work is actually not publicly available yet? No, um, so the Hansen data set is publicly available. It's available in, um, for 2013 and 2014. The emerging hotspots data set that we're working on, we're still working on it, um, but, but ultimately it, it will be available. Sorry, do you have the customers paying for this information? So this effort is partially funded by the Global Forest Watch Project. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, it's, a, it's a partnership convened by World Resources Institute. Um, and Blue Raster also uh, uh, has invested uh, some of its time, and we've worked closely with, with Esri um, as well. The Emerging Hotspots tool is a fairly new technology. Um, it brings some of the latest statistical and analytical capabilities into a spatial environment. And so we, we, w our research challenge really was to, was to look at the capacity of that by bringing in a global data set. So, Oftentimes, you, you might see crime data being analyzed. One of the great examples is looking at like Baltim the city of Baltimore where crime is happening. Well, we used AWS and the, and the big data tools to allow us to, to take basically a dot for every 30 meters for the entire globe. That's where the 800 billion count came from. And the net CDF format is so um, compact that once we were able to run it through the AWS pipeline, we got that into a NetCDF file, which was then capable of running the emerging hotspots. So, so to answer your question, it's, it's being paid for as part of a, a, a research effort, and then all of that data will be, will be, the plan is that it will all be published. Um, uh, I think I would expect to see that in the early part of 2016. Um, they're going through some publication processes as well, and so that sometimes takes a little bit of time. Uh, I think I think that's going to be uh, up to World Resources Re World Resources Institute. But generally speaking, all of the data that they produce is put out there for the greater good. Yeah. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it.